This is what happens when you let a quantum mechanic into your exoplanet uh, seminar. Um, let me talk about photosynthesis a little bit, uh, but from a very, very different perspective. Um, and this first slide, I, I should give this as a caveat. I run a research lab where we study quantum matter. So we basically build devices out of various quantum materials and we use lasers to study them. So I give that as a caveat because you should take with a grain of salt anything that I say after this point. Um, but one of the things that we think quite a lot about is how light generates electrons. And so when you think about that process, you find that there, there's relevance in a lot of different fields. And in this field of quantum matter and light, we've been quite successful. We've published lots of papers. Um, and while we've identified all of these little mechanisms, I think the bigger point of this lab and, and what I'm really interested in is whether or not we can come up with kind of quantum design principles. And so th this maybe gives you a little bit of insight into the way I've been thinking about biology, because in biology you can ask a very, very similar question. And you'll see how this leads to exoplanets in, in a bit, but let me digress. You, you should really ask yourself, and this question I think comes up in my head when I think about habitability on, on another planet, is are there kind of universal design principles of life? Are there some basic rules uh, that suggest life could basically operate independent of the machinery? Um, and one example of that, at least on Earth, is our current understanding of DNA and genetics and how that has kind of a macroscopic expression in, in terms of evolution. And largely, we have found on Earth that these design principles, when they do come up, they happen in the very small scales. And so as Richard Feynman said, uh, a very famous physicist, he said there's plenty of room at the bottom. So I'm going to talk about a model that takes us from the very, very smallest scales, the scales of quantum mechanics, all the way up to the scale of exoplanets, I hope. But I do have a little bit of guidance because I'm not the first physicist to think like this. In fact, Schrodinger, many of you probably know this, um, opined on exactly the same questions we're all standing here asking. And he looked at life as kind of a heat machine. So he used the language of thermodynamics to talk about what life was. And he said, it's by avoiding the rapid decay into equilibrium that life is so strange. When an organism, what they feed on is negative entropy, or they release entropy to their environment. So you can think of this language, if you're familiar with thermodynamics, he's talking about this with the same language that we would have talked about railroads and trains a uh, hundred years ago. Um, but another physicist, George Gamow, brought us a little bit closer to the exoplanetary home when he pointed out that the heat engine that we're talking about is the temperature difference between the star and the planet. And as long as there's a heat difference or a temperature gradient between those two, we can do work to basically create life. And so they were kind of cooking up an early design principle of life that, you know, the point is that the solar radiation arriving at Earth is out of equilibrium. And so that gives us a, a means to basically generate life. So they broke this into basically two pieces. I'm going to talk about photosynthesis because I think this is a really important indicator of life on another planet. Um, but they also to, to Schrodinger, metabolism was another important piece. So my lab, even though we study quantum materials, we now have a humongous effort in biophysics using kind of tools from the quantum world. Um, I study a lot of metabolism in single cells, but what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about our work uh, in photosynthesis. So just to give you a very brief two slide summary of the world of photosynthesis over the last uh, decade, it turns out that a whole bunch of quantum mechanics like myself jumped into the photosynthesis uh, problem. After an observation in uh, 2007, do you see these little wiggles in this plot? This was some optical measurement where they saw these little wiggles, these bumps. And the original interpretation was that there was some quantum coherent effect going on. So quantum mechanics was important, and this was done in the light harvesting complex of photosynthesis. It was done in the real macromolecule. So immediately, a whole bunch of physicists like myself said, okay, quantumness, that's something we can talk about. And we started contributing to this, this field. And there has been a debate now for about a decade or more about whether nature actually relies on, on quantum mechanics for photosynthetic energy transfer. So this is a humongous problem in the field of photosynthesis. But because of that, you end up with papers that have titles like this. Nature does not rely on long-lived electron coherence for energy transfer, and so very early on, this was a red flag for me to basically stay out of it, right? When you have these kind of two battling groups, I don't want to get into it, at least for now. 
And so we took a very different tact, and I think this tact uh, has, has we, we've learned something new that is not quantum mechanics. And the idea was this. So all of us can envision molecules, and this is the light harvesting complex of photosynthesis. It's actually a very highly ordered structure. So at these small scales, they form these little uh, kind of rings. There's, there's structures supported by these alpha and beta helices. And then these are all the pigments that make up kind of the light absorbing antenna. Now as a physicist, when I look at this, I know two things. One is that biology is messy and shakes a lot, right? It fluctuates. The other, I know that when two molecules overlap, if you remember from your basic quantum mechanics, when two molecules overlap, their wave functions overlap. And that's how energy jumps from one molecule to the next. And so because they're shaking, the energy transport through this thing is changing all the time in a very complicated way. And so we asked two questions. One was, does this really interesting ring structure actually cause something to happen, an emergence of something big? And is there something to learn about how energy moves through this thing? And as a physicist, I didn't want to get into this messy, complicated thing. Many other people did. A lot of chemists have been working on these problems. I went to something that is very well known in our field called the spherical cow. If you're not familiar with this, this is my one slide introduction of what I believe is the most powerful physics tool that we have. The idea is that we assume a very complicated system is a sphere. And I think the last talk talked a lot about ideas similar to this. You, you, you capture what you can in a way that you can come up with an intuition. And there's two rules here that give us advantages. And one is that these type of models, and I'll show you our model of this in a second, you, you write them down so they're exactly solvable. This is something that any undergraduate can write down and solve. That's, that's the first part. The more important advantage is that these are not restricted to reality. So whether I'm right or wrong doesn't matter as long as I gain some intuition. And this is the advantage that I think this model had, and we've been working on these models now for some time. Now I remind you, I'm an experimental quantum physicist writing down theories. So this again should take you even one step further away from trusting anything that I say, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> so we basically took this idea of a network, and we said, if what we argued was that what photosynthesis is doing is very important. It's regulating the way energy flows. And this is on all sorts of scales. You can basically say that this is a scale invariant model, it doesn't matter about the scale. And so when I write down this model, I can think of A as my pigment. So I take light in. So this is what's taking light in from, from the solar energy. And then I have some output that's doing work. It's doing some chemistry. It's a very, very simple model. And I'm only going to give you two equations in this whole entire talk. But the basic idea is this. I randomly, with some probability A, bring in power in this chlorophyll A molecule. It comes in at some rate, so the power coming in at A. And I want it to be as close to my output as possible. Now think of, if you, if you powered your lights in your room by a solar cell, and it was directly coupled, and suddenly the sun was very bright, your lights would be very bright. The sun goes a little dim, your lights would be very dim. This is basically what I'm arguing is trying to be avoided here. What I want this system to do is take in all of the random noise coming from the solar spectrum and make it steady on the output. So this is my second most complicated uh, equation. Because what we considered was what happens if, and this is the, I think the next natural logical progression, is what if we had two pigments, A and B, that coupled to this output? How does it change the model? This is a problem that undergraduates can solve. And I've actually done this in my statistical mechanics class. All I have is a probability of pulling energy in from A and B, and I want them to fix to this steady output. Now, I'm not going to go through the details, but you can show in this model that two inputs are intrinsically better than one at regulating. What this thing does is it takes in different rates of energy and power to basically regulate this photocell. So how does it connect to the solar spectrum? And this is where maybe exoplanetary science starts to become a little more clear. Here's a picture of kind of the photon energy flux as a function of wavelength. So imagine this is my black body of a, of a hot star. And I have these two pigments right at the peak of that spectrum, and they're getting exactly the right rate of energy into the photosystem. So life is happily kind of churning along. And then suddenly the atmosphere changes, so a cloud passes by, and it gets much, much brighter. Now I'm getting too much energy, I start to produce dangerous singlet oxygen species, the photocell starts to die, biology is unhappy. And so it turns out that having these two at the peak is not great, because suddenly I get too much intensity from the star, 
And this thing has to now down convert. It has to say, wait, wait, that's too much energy. How do I deal with it? But if I have those two somewhere else on the spectrum, so take them away from the peak, and I put them over here where there's a steep slope, now I get a really funny effect. I have two basic different powers. I have a high, a high power and a low power, and I can switch between them randomly. So now I have a way, just like your air conditioner keeps your room at a fixed temperature, a way to regulate if the, if the conditions change. So now if, if my optimal was not going to work at the peak, we can ask, how does it work here? And it turns out by having these two different inputs, these two different rates of input, it actually quiets the noise, it regulates better. So this was our model. So if I have a, a solar spectrum that looks like this, I know that I can live on that steepest slope or that one, and they both equivalently basically regulate solar energy. So the idea is that these are basically like an active uh, circuit, and when you look at the energy inside the photocell as a function of time, it's very, very noisy, but what you get in the end is on average, it matches exactly the output. So this is kind of the microscopic model. It's basically I have two input channels, they regulate the power coming in, and it kind of regulates the energy in the photocell. So the idea here was that what photosynthesis is actually doing is not just trying to capture all the light, it's actually trying to regulate how much of that light energy is used. Now here's the part where it became kind of interesting. If you take this model, and you just take the spectrum on Earth, so that gray line, is basically the solar power irradiance on Earth as a function of wavelength. And you look, this is the, the top plot is basically the absorption spectra of the LHC2 in green plants. And then we ran our model and we said, if we have that input spectrum, what are the most optimal wavelengths to absorb? And it turns out we got two pairs exactly or very close to where they show up in green plants. Now, I published this paper, nobody believed a word of it, and in fact, a very famous botanist said, this is great, you know, great physics, but it isn't relevant to biology. I then went on to meet him two years later, his name is Richard Cogdell. He basically told me about these bacteria. These are basically purple bacteria. Their spectrum is shifted to the red because they live under, uh, under the canopy, so that they see a different solar spectrum. And we were able to reproduce again their absorption spectrum with the same premise, that what nature is doing is essentially regulating by reducing the noise in the system. Then we did another one. We looked under seawater, and we looked at these, uh, these uh, green sulfur bacteria, and again, we were able to reproduce their absorption spectrum. What you'll see in all of these, which is really kind of key, is that all of them come in pairs, they all have two pigments, and they all live on this part of the spectrum that is not the peak. So there seems to be some general behavior. And we went on to prove that this happens in a lot of organisms. We now have a library of about 30 different organisms where the same simple model basically reproduces this idea that photosynthesis is basically regulating. Now, we published this paper in Science in 2020, and uh, you know, one of the things that the uh, news media picked up was this idea that we now had a model that might explain why plants are green on Earth. Because it says that it should avoid the peak because that's where the noise is the highest. Um, and so we went on to use this model to do a lot of new things. We're now studying it in, in real organisms. We're using this to look at kind of different ways of uh, realizing this type of model. But I think more importantly to this group is we've been talking a lot and thinking a lot about other planets. Because the obvious thing that came out of this model was that if you hand me the black body spectrum of a star, so let's say I take just the ideal black body spectrum of, of our sun, I can tell you what photosynthesis should look like if it's regulating that energy on the planet. And so this is one of the examples. If I plug in just the temperature of the sun, I look at what photosynthesis should look like, and it looks quite similar to what we see on, on, on Earth. So we started to explore this a little bit more deeply, and we used this idea basically to look at nearby stars, stars that we were just interested in thinking about. Now, another caveat, I know nothing about exoplanets. I just started picking out stars that I thought were interesting. I know that there are some planets that have been observed near these, so we tried it. Um, when we looked at Alpha Centauri A as an example, it has a pretty similar temperature, and so you get a pretty similar answer to Earth. But if you take another star like Alpha Centauri B, it's a little bit cooler, and so it shifts that ideal spectrum to the red and then it predicts that these peaks should then also correspondingly shift. So we're no longer necessarily getting the same color of plants because we're avoiding a different peak 
of that solar spectrum. So if you look at this, we, we can do these calculations in, in lots of different ways. Um, the Sun and Alpha Centauri have nearly identical absorbers inside our model. Um, and so you'd expect something like green plants on, Alpha Cent around, on a planet near Alpha Centauri A. Um, Alpha Centauri B has red shifted, so it shifts this model a bit to the red. And so you'd expect kind of yellow plants. Now this all seems like a very simple toy model, but at least on Earth it has reproduced kind of dozens of different microorganisms. And so we asked about Kepler. And I had some interest in Kepler, and I'll explain the reason why. Um, if you look at Kepler-186, we know its temperature is something in the 3700 Kelvin. And that's quite a bit cooler than our sun. And so it should really shift that spectrum pretty far to the red. And so we did our calculation, and we get these uh, absorbers and where they, they might absorb to kind of regulate. And you get the answer that it has a, a substantially redshifted environment, right? So it's going to shift this whole thing to the red. And so you'd expect kind of this absorption that is avoided to be red or infrared. And this agreed with what people had also thought via other models. And so there was other, some other work, earlier work through NASA that had talked a little bit about this. Um, and so our model gave, gave us a, a nice answer. And oddly, this whole project was started by a YouTuber um, named Atlas Pro. So you can look this up on your computers right now. He actually interviewed me and asked about Kepler-186f and what our model kind of told him about it. And so if you look this video of why this planet would have red plants, we kind of argue that our model does give an answer and a, a systematic model to understand these things. And so we kind of pushed forward with this and we said, can we understand more about all of the possible planets and their temperatures of their, of their neighboring stars? And so we came up with this plot where what I plot here is the wavelength of these absorbers on the left and then the temperature, the ideal kind of black body temperature of that star. And what you see again is that there are pairs. There's a pair of absorbers that peak in the, in the red, and then there's a pair kind of on the blue side of, of the spectrum. And so what you can do is you can encode in this plot the color of the plant life that would show up on that organism based on our model. So we can basically consider this kind of excluded band and say that you know, down here at high temperatures, the, the plant life would be more to the blue. As things cool off, it would be more towards the red. Um, but we, we have knowledge and we understand that this is not, you know, these stars are not ideal and we have other things like this. But we could classify this in a way uh, that, that basically is according to the type of star. So you can have this entire kind of spectrum and just say, if photosynthesis is always happening in pairs, these kind of absorbing pairs, and if it's regulating, these are the colors we could see. But then we wanted to add one more bit, and I think this is one of the places where I have lots of questions from this community, is we said, on Earth, it's not actually an ideal black body, right? This, this spectrum is modified by different absorption characteristics, for instance, in our atmosphere. So could we take uh, an ideal black body, so the temperature of a star, and start to input some information about absorption spectra? And so as just a first try, we just assumed that we were looking at a planet with a very Earth-like atmosphere. So we took kind of the absorption characteristics of an Earth-like atmosphere. And we got this really interesting plot. I want to I point out a couple of things about this plot. So what this assumes is that I have an ideal black body star from all the different classes that we can think about. And it assumes that we have some Earth-like atmosphere, so nitrogen, oxygen, at the same levels that, that Earth it has. And you can, obviously this is a model, so you can tune all of those things. But the outcome of this is actually pretty interesting in that we get a region where there's kind of a, a, a largest range of wavelength and temperature where you would expect to see photosynthetic life on a planet. So to me, this kind of gave us a sweet spot of what I would call kind of photosynthetic habitability. There seems to be a largest range of hot black body temperatures and wavelengths, and it turns out that Earth fell right inside this, this largest area. So Earth kind of sits right at the bottom of this plot. And in fact, you can think that this is maybe another kind of target for looking for photosynthesis on other planets. And so again, we, we basically, not only are we able to calculate these things, it would be nice to basically expand this model, which we're currently in the process of doing, but we do find that this model about quieting noise and regulating on Earth seems to give us a nice idea about how to think about it on other planets. Um, and this is a really cool picture, though the colors are not great on the, on the projector screen, 
This was a, a picture created by this YouTuber who interviewed me where he basically false colored everything red, and it's quite an eerie sight to think about what uh, these planets would look like adapted to an infrared star. Um, and so finally, I should just acknowledge all of the people. I think one of the cool things about this conference is just the multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, uh, kind of way of thinking. The people that I've worked with over time come from all different fields. So I have some uh, botanists and kind of quantum biologists. I have condensed matter people who study superconductivity. And I have a plethora of students, microbiologists, everything. Um, but on top of that, I should acknowledge uh, really the main drivers of this. So Trevor is now a fellow at uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. He studies quantum mechanics, but he's the one who actually was doing some of these calculations of Earth-like atmospheres. Um, and on top of that, I should definitely point out that the NSF has funded some of this work very early on, and the Presidential Early Career Award in the US uh, has been a really large supporter of this. And the last thing I should say is that very sadly, None of those people that I showed are exoplanetary astronomers, so I don't have any of those friends yet. So if you're interested in chatting, we should talk more about this. I have a lot to learn. The model's very simple, but it already gives us some interesting insight. Um, and so with that, I would like to say thank you, and I hope I kept things grounded in the, in the exoplanetary science world. Thank you. So, so we, we can estimate that. We, we get a number in green plants of something like 40 to 50% less noisy. So it suppresses by about a factor of two. Um, the way we understand that is actually through some recent measurements by Rink van Brondel. He, he studied only the light harvesting complex. So it doesn't study any of the downstream kind of chemistry, right? Um, the way we're studying it now, and I don't have time to talk about it here, is rather than look at natural photosynthetic systems, so in, in natural real conditions, we're actually now growing bacteria with a, a thing called a supercontinuum laser, which is a broadband white light source, where we artificially modulate the frequency of excitation. And so we're looking at ways of not just affecting kind of fixation or other processes, but actually seeing if they grow better or worse based on the fluctuations. And that growth has something to do with basically ATP use and, and how the cells are developed. So, so these are hugely important questions. Um, we're in the very early phases of it. But we're trying to find ways. I would say I'm a benchtop physicist, so I'm growing microbes in the lab now with lasers, and it's a highly controlled environment for me. So we're starting to kind of turn on the noise knob and then ask those questions. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Let's get together. Yeah, for sure. I would be glad to. I'm Great. Very the other very quick comment is that I always worry about organisms trying to take advantage of the infrared because oh, there's yeah. not that much energy there. I mean, it's one thing, you know, sort of beggars can't be choosers on the earth. Okay. But okay. It's, uh, it's really a great place. I, I can show you something now if you wanted to see it. We, we see vast amounts of infrared absorption in these bugs in Rhodobacter steroidus. Nice. That is not explained by photosynthesis. So you uh, Rhodobacter spheroides is a very well studied purple non sulfur bag. None of this is published, but I'd be glad to show you. We're doing exactly this. Infrared experiments is where to work. Hi. Hi. I'm a student in the University of Sofia, studying physics, but I'm kind of transitioning to biology. So my question. Don't, don't be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> My question is um, a little bit on the biological side. Mm -hmm. You said that you're just now putting in the um, less controllable conditions, so yeah. now you're in more um, kind of chosen preconditions. But is there, uh, you also said that you have reproduced um, microorganisms and how they have their life. Is there evidence, uh, biological evidence, or if there isn't, is, are there ways for gaining it? 
um, to prove that those um, biological pigments actually absorb in, in pairs. And yeah, that is a great question. This is the key question. Yeah, and my kind of second part of the question is, can those pairs be uh, further away? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let, let, let me answer the first one because I think it's a key question that our experiments are actually trying to do. Uh, this is, there's a little bit of sophistication here that maybe is annoying to hear about, but we could talk more about it. One way to prove it is to take a rainbow of light and then a second rainbow that you've off-shifted so that a given bug that's under that rainbow sees only those two colors, right? So you then correlate, I see both, you know, blue and then purple, right? And you correlate whether that accelerates the photosynthetic system. And we're doing exactly those measurements right now. So we are using, this is why we're using lasers in this super continuum source. That is the key question, I think, uh, about this as, in terms of verifying it. Now, the other key question is basically about fluctuations. There has been evidence, for instance, that you can grow corn much, much, much faster and more efficiently, more yield by removing one of these uh, basically pathways to, to move energy out of the system. So what they've done in those genetic experiments is remove the ability to avoid fluctuations, and they see that corn grows like crazy. So these are really fundamental questions, and all of what I've talked about today is kind of the model. We are running experiments all over the place to answer those questions. Uh, so my, I have a couple of questions, um, so let's just do them one by one. But So the first thing is, I mean, there's, is there physics that you take into account as you move towards the infrared? Because presumably at some point, you know, you don't have enough energy to actually excite electronic transitions. And uh, because as you move towards the infrared, you just do vibrational transitions and rotation. Sure. So there must be a limit to that. And okay. Is that something you... Yeah, yeah this, this, this is a really important question. So, so at, I'll, I'll put on my physics hat for a minute. The, the fundamental limitation is basically thermal energy at room temperature, which is 23, just for, keep this number in mind, 20, 20 and a little bit milli electron volts. So that's milli electron volts. The photons in the infrared are something around one electron volt, so a thousand milli electron volts. So that cutoff, fundamentally, that cutoff doesn't happen until deep into the mid-infrared. As long as you say there's some mechanism that can harvest that energy. So it could be, for instance, this could be controversial, but let me argue that maybe vibrations could be harvested to basically create free electrons to do chemistry. Maybe it's happening, maybe not. But, but do you see that I think the fundamental number is basically thermal energy at room temperature. But there's, then there's a humongous question of what the chemistry is, the biochemistry of how it would do it. And I, I keep that, as a physicist, I keep that in, in the okay. experts. Field. And then there's sort of part B to that question. It's what about the, the short wavelength end. Imagine you've got an early Earth. Yeah. So now the UV is coming in, yeah. right? I mean, have you considered that? Because then your blue peak might shift to the UV. Absolutely. That, that's right. And I think within our model, it's agnostic. And so, sure, it could happen. But again, the danger in that is that there's a lot of mechanisms that we would have to uncover to basically harvest that energy. I think, personally, it's possible. Chemistry will, will somehow work itself out to harvest that energy. Uh, but, but there's no evidence either way. Right? But I think you're right, it would shift towards the blue as you go towards these kind of higher temperature. Okay, stars. and my second question was, and this is the naive question, oh, which is, um, you said that uh, you, know, you have this peak in the red for the solar spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and, and, you know, one argument is yeah. there in the literature, going back to the 70s, mm -hmm. is that when you plot the Planck function, not as watts per meter squared per number, number per you, the number of photons yeah. is actually highest in the red. Yeah. Um, and is that the reason why, you know, partly why that's a low noise part of the spectrum? Because there's fewer photons elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. But then how do you rationalize the blue though? Because yeah, 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 this is right. So, so you know, this is a subtlety that I could, we could talk a long time about. Um, the question has to become, you know, downstream in photosynthesis, what is it doing with that rate of energy coming in? And so that's why we use the power spectrum. And it turns out when you look at power, it peaks in the green, and so that's why we, the model works itself out that way. Um, I think it is really, really important to understand some of the mechanisms of photosynthesis before we can make strong statements about what would happen as you go bluer or, or more red. Because in our current understanding of photosynthesis, there are no pathways 
that would allow us to harvest energy too far in those extremes, right? But that's our current understanding. I think we're still learning about photosynthesis. It is we match what photosynthesis gives. But if you change that, if you say I have pigments that broaden and do different things, then it changes the way they separate from blue to red. And so that whole entire spectrum kind of shifts a little bit. So there's some subtleties here that give us the right answer. What we took to, to match photosynthesis is the real broadening of the, the absorbing peaks in photosynthesis. And it gives us exactly the right answer, or the, the same answer. But I think there's a lot of subtlety that we could talk about, about how, you, how those things move as you change some of the parameters in the system, meaning how they separate. One last question. Uh, two comments. First of all, I can't understand how below the energy of electronic transition the light can be effective in the photosynthesis. You need the, something that, yeah. that will excite an electron. It cannot be no, done. No, that's, that's right. That's so, right. so the thermal energy is not really the limit. The no, limit no, that's true. It's absorption, and that's, we know it's beyond one electron. Well, we know that, it, we know that with, with the photosynthetic systems that, that rely on a reaction center. I would say, so, so xanthophils, that, that's what fixes the one EV energy scale. My point was, if you go outside of this paradigm that you need a reaction center, what you really fundamentally need is a charge transfer state. And, and, and those can happen just about any energy scale. Okay, and another comment regarding the energy. We, we have to remember that most of the light reaching plants are not direct emission from the sun. That's oh, scattered okay. light. That's right. And that's really important. And we yeah. know that, for example, the plant changes color according to the amount of yeah, light that's right. that's right. they pour. So I think. Taking this picture of the two absorption is, is oversimplified. Oh, absolutely. But, but I think, again, that's the, the strength. This is a really good point. So some of the things that we've worked with, for instance, is looking at how scattered light changes the model. And we get, for instance, you can estimate the color of plants as a, as a distance away from the equator, which is a well-known measurement. People have measured this. And we actually reproduce that as well. So, so there are some subtleties in the model. The, the main thing is like any model, garbage in, garbage out. So if I put a, 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 a spectrum in, the model just tells me, given that spectrum, the best place to operate is here, here, and here. Now, if that spectrum changes because of scattering or because of various mechanisms like phototropism, you know, there's many different ways to vary it, then I'm putting in the wrong input to the model. But so far, I would say this model has been pretty robust given its simplicity. You know, we've matched now dozens of, of microbes. I, I'm an experimentalist. I should end here because I know I'm running over. But let me say one thing. You know, the difference between a physics theorist and a physics experimentalist is that a physics theorist believes they're in a model and nobody else does. And a physics experimentalist doesn't believe their own work, but everybody else does. <laughs> I'm somewhere in between where you shouldn't believe it. I don't believe it, and neither should you. Right? I, I'm an experimentalist doing doing the model. So, so I, that, that's my uh, take with a grain of salt message. But if, if it's right, we may, have, we, we may have a new intuition about the way photosynthesis works. That, that's the whole thing. Uh, well, thank you again for the talk. And You're welcome. Uh, next talk, last talk, and whoops, is this talk? Uh, it will be by Trevor Trevor. We'll uh, decide on giving a good talk.